Well, hey guys, welcome to Mercer Creek Church Online. And if you're joining us online, maybe you hear something you're not used to hearing when you tune into uh, JoJo's bedroom for worship. Um, and, and what that is, is we are now beginning to open up and, and step into these uh, more live gatherings. We still have plenty of restrictions, but tonight we're joined by uh, some, of our worship, some of our leadership here at Mercer Creek as we kind of work out all the kinks in preparation for uh, hopefully having so many more of you come and join us. So just so you know, uh, and I understand there's some kind of wide angle if you haven't seen it yet, this, this kind of, we're a little spread out. Maybe you saw Pastor Todd's video. Things look a little different here, but we are excited that we have the opportunity to worship here together live while also joining you at home to worship as well. So tonight and this morning or whatever time you join us for worship, I wanna invite you to do a couple different things. I wanna invite you to fully enter in. Yeah, it may look like we're back at this building, but you are joining us right now in your living room, in your bedroom, in your office. And, and I wanna invite you to dive in as we worship. Kids, those of you kids who are in the room with your parents, I wanna challenge you tonight or this morning or whenever you're watching this, make sure you sing louder than mom and dad, okay? That's your challenge today, okay? But as we begin in worship, we, uh, I, I, you know, our world has been a little crazy and wild lately, but I'm, I'm glad that we can pause once a week and turn our attention, turn our focus to God, our King. And I'm reminded that Philippians says that, that we are citizens of heaven, those of us who follow Jesus. And we need to turn our attention in these uncertain, these crazy wild times to our good King, our good Father, the one we follow, the one we have life in. So would you join us by standing and let's sing together today.
gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let Father God, we lean into you. No earthly kingdom, Lord God, brings peace, brings hope, brings joy, brings life like yours does. So we lean into your kingdom right now, Father God. You are our hope and our joy. I ask, Lord God, I pray that your presence will be felt here right now, Lord Jesus, in every home and in this place, and that it would flow out of us, Lord God, and into our neighborhoods, into our government, Lord God, into those who have been disenfranchised, Lord, those who are feeling hurt and pain right now, that you'd reach and touch every life.
Sir. Dear Father, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the time that we get to spend in our households, God, worshiping and proclaiming your good name. God, I pray that just in this time and with the message that Todd has prepared for us, God, um, that we just be ready and, and able to receive it, God. God, we know that just, just what's going on in our world right now, God, is hard. It's difficult for many of us, God, and God, we just ask for your healing hand over it all. God, we'd ask for your wisdom on how to console and help people right now. And we'd, God, we'd just ask for your comfort um, in a time that's so stretching and molding for a lot of us that the change is not by design something that we're accustomed to, God. I, Lord, I just ask that on all of us. It's something that you'd remain, um, you just remain in us with. So God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time of worship. And God, thank you for the message we're about to um, just receive in our hearts today. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to continue our, wor our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings back to the Lord. Um, and the best ways to give are through our mercercreek.org slash give website or through our mobile app. Um, mail even works as well. And we thank you to those that are still able to give in this time. Um, we, we greatly appreciate it. We're going to be continuing our Ask Mercer Anything series uh, next week. So if you have any questions that you would like um, answered, um, whether it's about theology, spiritual gifts, how the church is structured, just, just anything, uh, feel free to ask um, and you can submit your questions um, at mercercreek.org slash questions. Now let's head over to Pastor Todd as he begins our Ask Mercer Anything series. Thanks, church. So I've been struggling with deep lament this last week about the senseless killings in the African-American community. I couldn't bring myself to watch uh, someone being murdered um, on live TV. I, and I know, I know many of you have. It, it's tragic and wrong and the worst kind of evil. When trusted authority abuses its power, outrage and anger is the right first response. Um, this weekend, we had planned to start um, this kind of fun and different thing called Ask Mercer Anything. And in light of all that's happened, I wanted to kind of switch courses. So I said to Dan and to Dwayne, who are going to do this kind of panel thing with me, guys, not this week. 
I need to address this issue and this issue alone. And then next week we can go back and we can do some of these um, questions where we're like, hey, church, you can ask us anything, right? So I, I really want to go after racism this week. I think it's so important to talk about this and, and talk about what it means in our culture right now, what it means for our church, that it would be inappropriate for me to do anything else. So with that in mind, will you pause with me right now? Let's pray. Lord God, um, I'm so grateful that you're the God who sees all things and knows all things. And I ask for your amazing intervention in the American culture right now. Lord, would you provide for us a way forward? And Lord, I even ask that specifically for this church. Would you help for this church provide a way forward? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I uh, talk about this subject and attempt, what I'm going to actually do is answer questions that were asked specifically about this topic. But as I answer these questions, I realize this, sometimes what the person who asked it intended is not how we answer it. It's not intentional. It's just how we read into something or read it, and, or maybe there was looking for a different nuance. And so for those who ask questions, and this will happen throughout this Ask Mercer Anything series, there, there'll just be different ways of answering it. What we want to do today though, is to try to do my best to answer these questions um, as best as I know how, and hopefully, um, this will be part of our way of looking forward and knowing what Jesus really does have to say about all this stuff. So here's the first question. Why don't more churches speak out about social injustices in the moment? It seems like so many remain quiet when there are opportunities to share how Jesus would respond. Love this question. I have been longing to speak out about this, but I want to actually give you a little bit of perspective on me in this because I think this actually matters too. A few people are coming to me, Todd, are we speaking about this? You know, this was last weekend. Are we speaking about it? Are we speaking about it? It's like, uh, you have to understand something. When I hear about stuff that's this serious and this big, I have to take time to process. Um, what I have learned through the years is it's better for me to listen first and to actually work through some of my anger issues about things rather than just you know, blurting out what I think is, should happen or what shouldn't happen. Uh, and so part of this and the reason it's coming this weekend and not last weekend is because I needed time to process. And believe me, I have been processing this a ton. On the other hand, um, there's also this new reality that's going on right now in our culture, and I, what I mean by this in our church culture with COVID. Because we have to do all this stuff digitally, like you're experiencing right now, um, we actually do tape this a few days earlier um, and put the pieces together so that it, it can actually appear like it's a service that's, you know, and again, we're trying to do a professional job for you. Uh, the, the issue with that is that we're not as flexible too. So when this kind of blew up last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all that, we had already filmed everything. It already put it together. The service was already done. And so again, in some ways, this is as fast as we are able to respond. Okay. So I just want you to understand about, about Mercer and our response. We're not trying to be slow in our response. We, we're simply trying to be reasonable. And, and, and that's, these are the times we find ourselves in. Uh, but the second part of that was, hey, well, why don't churches respond? I, I honestly can't speak for other churches. That wouldn't be fair. I just know that I can speak for our church and I want to desperately speak about this. So, uh, secondly, uh, that, as that question was asked, there's a an, kind of an allusion to, okay, so isn't it time for the church to talk about what Jesus was saying? And I want to actually do that right now. And here's what I want to say. This is my, my kind of my biggest and, and most important point in all this is Jesus modeled humility, which is the opposite of racism. I, I want you to make sure and catch this. Jesus modeled humility, which is the opposite of racism. And, and again, he's, he's our guide. He's who we're supposed to emulate. He teaches us so much. Think about these, th this, this phrase. This comes from Philippians chapter two. In your relationships with one another. So how do we interact with one another? This is what the scripture teaches us. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So how we interact, how races interact, how people interact, how humans interact should be just like how Jesus interacted with us. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Jesus, who had all authority, all power, all privilege, all rights, and literally that all creation was due to him, he had all of that under his command, yet he modeled humility as the correct means of interacting with humanity. He so loved all people, all people, that he died for them. This is our model. Racism is the opposite of that. Racism says, I am better. Racism says, you are less. Racism says, you don't matter, or at least how much you matter is less than how much I matter. Racism is ultimately selfish. It's about elevating your personhood over another because they look different, speak different, or have a different color of skin. Where there is pride, there is often its insidious partner, racism. Racism is not the way of Jesus. It never has been, and it never will be. If you want to do a gut check on this about how maybe, oh, well, I don't, you know, Todd, I don't struggle with race. That's not an issue for me. I, I want you to simply ponder this question. And it may take some time to actually be honest with yourself, but ask this of yourself. Is there anyone who looks differently than me who I think is less than me? Be honest. The people you interact with, the people you see on the streets, the people that you know who live in different parts of our country or world, do you see them differently than you? Use that question as your homework, and I think it will help you reveal much about your soul. But I want you to notice, and I'm just going to give you a few snapshots of how Jesus interacted with people. In Jewish culture, one of the hated other type of people were this group called the Samaritans. And they were a pagan culture that the Jews could not stand and did not like at all. They thought they were dirty and filthy. And, you know, it just there's, they didn't like the Samaritans at any level. And there is this famous story in the Bible about how Jesus goes to a well and there's a Samaritan woman there. Let's make it even worse. Not only a Samaritan, but also a woman. And he engages her and offers her salvation and talks about a salvation that's given to her from him that is beautiful and awesome and will last forever. In Matthew chapter 9, we read about how Jesus uh, went to a person in culture that everyone else didn't approve of and didn't, didn't like, called a tax collector. And it even says in the scripture in this text in Matthew 9, it says, yeah, so he went over to Matthew's house, the tax collector, and he was there with all these other sinners because the guys he hung out with, because they were, at least in his their worldview, marginalized in culture, were all together. And the religious, the church people of the day looked at it and go, how in the world, why would Jesus hang out with them? And what he wanted to show over and over again, no, no, I accept all types. You probably remember one of Jesus' most famous parables that actually has to do a lot with neighboring when someone asked him, so Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he again used that Samaritan person again in the parable. This time it was a Samaritan, it was called the Good Samaritan. We all know it's one of the most famous passages in the Bible about the guy who helped and who didn't help. It was the religious people, the non-compassionate ones. And this Good Samaritan did all the right. And this is what Jesus said, this is what a good neighbor looks like. I mean, there's many more stories, but the bottom line is this. Jesus longed that all people, all types of people would engage him and his rule and reign. Church, when I see another black person in our culture get needlessly killed, another abuse of power or act of prejudice, it is an obvious symptom that America is still fighting this great evil and our systems are broken. It is wrong. It should not happen. We must stand for a different reality because it does not represent God's kingdom or Jesus' way. One of the defining verses for me this last week comes from the same chapter that we've been talking about um, in this last series called Adapting. I just went back to Romans chapter 12. And right there in Romans 12, it says it so clearly, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. If you have been outraged and angered and frustrated and feeling overwhelmed by the sheer injustice of what happened, you are hating what is evil. That is the right response. I have been grappling with my own outrage and anger in the last week or so. And it hit me as I was talking to my friends and family who live in Minneapolis where George Floyd was killed. And I'm, I'm talking to my sister and she says, I think, I think I'm going to go down and take my, my kids down. And I want to show them where this happened. She wanted to, to let her anger and outrage be, be, have a place to have some, just see where it was, process what the let her kids see. This is what violence looked. This is what racism looked. Don't ever let this happen. 
Why? Because we must hate what is evil. It is right to be outraged. It is right to have sadness. It is right to protest. It really is. It's right to want to find a way forward, but we must cling to what is good. There are so many, so, so many who are protesting peacefully with wisdom and grace, and we must cling to that. And most everyone is abhorring the looting because we all know that unhealthy behavior doesn't advance anything. Hate what is evil, but don't join the evil. Cling to what is good. Why? Because this is what love looks like in a very racially charged space that we find ourselves in right now. There's this marvelous story in the middle of the book of Acts where the apostle Peter gets his racial worldview blown up. For Peter, he was a Jew about Jews. Jews were all that mattered. It was only his people, nobody else. And God gives him a vision that actually God wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was that God wanted the Jewish people to be for the world. And he was giving Peter a much bigger picture. And out of that, Peter made this response after God's vision um, radically changed his heart. Then Peter began to speak. He says this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Okay. There is no favorites. It's not like God loves the white race more than the black race or the browns more than, you know, I mean, it it just doesn't work that way. But he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. This was a radical shift, a game changer for Peter's worldview. Every nation on earth, every people group, every language, and every tribe are eligible to access for God's kingdom. This would have been a mind-blowing reality for him. Church, here's the deal. When we treat people of different colors or who speak different languages less than us, we do not understand God's intentions. God longs that all people would come to himself, all people, anyone, everywhere. You, of course, remember the most famous of all Bible verses, John 3, 16. It says this, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say for God so loved America or for God so loved the Nicaraguans or for God so loved the Filipinos. No, it wasn't just one nation. No, for God so loved the world, the whole world, everybody. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If God is offering the whole world salvation, what does that tell you? It tells you that everyone, absolutely everyone is wanted and loved by God. So this is why I can say unequivocally, there is no way that racism stands up in God's economy. It is wrong and evil and should not be participated. We need to do what it takes to undo it in our culture. Question two, does Mercer leadership believe that the church plays an important role in addressing racism and that it should not be a back burner topic? Truthfully, I'm going to be really truthful here. Um, and I'll have to answer this carefully, but I mean, the answer is kind of like a yes and a no. And, and I'll explain what that means. Let's start with the first part. Does the church play an important role in addressing racism? Without Jesus and his teaching, we wouldn't have the culture we have or the goodness that we know. Without Jesus, we wouldn't have the care for the poor, orphanages, hospitals, and education as we know it. So much good has been historically come from Christians who take seriously the idea that all people, Not just some people, but all people are made in the image of God. And that the least of these still have value. That God loves everyone. Should this be a back burner topic? No, but it has been. And I have to ask the question, why? Why has it been a back burner topic? First, the hard truth in addressing racism is this in Kittitas County. We are white, very white here. Meaning that whites are so dominant, there is very little other voices. I was looking at our stats as far as who populates our culture in Kittitas, and the census report tells me that 84% of the people here are white, significantly higher even than our national average. Like, we're really white here. What this does in one way is avoid the race issue altogether. Because instead of the national average of 13% black, we have 1% black. Instead of the national average of 16% Latino, we have 9% Latino. With significant less racial diversity, there comes along with that significantly less awareness. So no, historically, this has not been, at least in my knowledge, a front burner issue. But should it be? Yes. Yes, indeed. Whenever the kingdom of darkness pushes against the kingdom of God, we should respond with grace and goodness. Church. 
This issue has been a gut check for me because our work as a church is primarily to advance God's kingdom. And we may do that with missions. We may do that with church planting. We may do that by serving families or having age-specific ministries or even what we're doing right now, having a digital service in this time of COVID. But if we are not advancing God's kingdom with all cultures, all colors, and all people locally, we are missing the mark. So when I ponder this question, I realize, at least from my vantage point, we are not doing enough. It's easy to just be the church and, and not attend to the specific of minority groups. And I need to ask all of you, people of color, will you please forgive me? Forgive me because I have not been attuned to this and this has woken up my soul. I have been so heavy with this over the last couple of weeks. But I, I want to do something more than just have outrage, more than just put a post on Facebook. Again, it, it's great to learn and, and I'm reading new books and I'm having conversations with people. But as I've been pondering and praying, I've been asking God, will you show us a way forward for our church? Here's why. Because the biblical roadmap is that all people matter to God. So in the, in the Bible, in the book of Galatians, Jesus says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And what Paul is doing here is he's starting to see the progression and change in the church. He's saying, if you're going to be changed, you've got to be ready for it. And let me tell you who's going to be involved. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. The person of Jesus makes all of us one, which really speaks to how I believe we must be engaging Kittitas County. Until all parts of our county are actively involved in our faith community, we have not yet mimicked the ways of Jesus. We are not yet one here. Until our church looks like the demographics of our county, we have not been obedient to the ways of Jesus and we are not one. There are some of you out there that I know want to actively help us out and move towards it. And here's what I'm saying to you right now. We need your help. If you actively want to move forward, again, again I, don't, I don't want just words right now. I want to find a solution and move forward. What can we do to actively engage the minority culture here in Kittitas County? The 84% of us can engage the 16% of us. I, I, one of the cool things that's happening, it was it's already happening before this started, was that the management team and governing board has been talking about the idea of how do we engage the Hispanic culture that we don't have in our church? We've been asking questions, is, is this the time now to start a, a, another church, a Hispanic church, so that God's glory can be to all cultures and all people here? And again, it's, it's just an idea, right? We have, we have no bones to this at all. But we've been asking the question because this bigger question is, is how do we do this here in Kittitas County? I believe that is the biggest, most underrepresented group people group in our church. That was my big dog just making a move there if you heard a little noise. Again, it's, it's too early to know what to do yet, but man, we have some dreams. I believe that our church activated can make an enormous difference across the racial divide here in Kittitas County. A couple weeks ago, I mean, this was like God's gift to me. It was like a proof thing um, from my history. I, I got a, um, a Facebook post from a guy. I was like, man, I think I recognize that name. And he comes to go, he, he, he personal messaged me. He goes, Hey, Todd, was your dad the pastor of First Baptist Church in Salem, you know, years ago? I'm like, Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. And he said this one phrase, and I mean, we went back and forth a little bit. He said this, he helped the Cambodian community so much. Now, where I had grown up in Salem, uh, the, the, the Hmong and Cambodian community were kind of growing in our area. And my dad's church had a part of starting another church within a church to help a people group that spoke a different language. And they wanted to make sure they could help and understand Jesus. And here a guy is coming to me, what is this, 30 years later, and say, hey, by the way, that was awesome what happened back then. Church, I want to have that type of legacy here that all people in Kittitas County could say, oh yeah, that Mercer Creek Church, they cared for everybody. Question number three. How will the church leadership encourage the church to support and provide a church culture that looks specifically at the needs of disenfranchised populations? 
This question broadens the conversation. First, let's talk about who the disenfranchised populations could be. Again, I'm trying to interpret what the question is asking. Perhaps this does mean minorities. And again, we've been talking a little bit about that, but it's Black, Asian, Native Americans, Hispanics, Pacific Islanders, or other mixed race people, according to our census poll. Or perhaps what you're meaning by disenfranchises the poor, those who are in desperate need, those who can't eat, those who are homeless. Or maybe you mean single moms, not that all single moms are disenfranchised, but young single moms specifically who have this huge bear burden of bearing a child by themselves. Or maybe you were thinking about disability cultures. Again, I, I don't know exactly what was intended by this question, but I know there's even others beyond there. So how do we encourage the church to support these cultures? Which is a great question. My most basic suggestion to us as a church is engage. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. You have gifts and talents and abilities and resources to change the lives of other people. The most obvious and essential way to do this is love those who live around you. Yes, you've heard that from me many times, that it is Jesus' first and best way forward, but we can do more than that. It would be insulting to consider that all minorities are disenfranchised. To some of my friends, and quite frankly, even my wife, this isn't true at all. But what is very true, that is, as a majority culture, as the white culture, we need to listen. And I want to share with you a verse I shared with you just a couple of weeks ago, because I believe this verse is one of the best things that can happen to us as a white culture here in Kittitas County when we're engaging something that's a very hot issue right now. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Church, I want to encourage you. I have been given a gift of being married to a minority. I have slipped up and made mistakes on race in the privacy of my own home. My wife has been gracious, yet I have learned that I don't always comprehend what minorities go through compared to what I go through. This last week, I, I was talking with some different friends. One of my friends, um, she was talking with her African-American son. This is, she lives out on the East Coast. And she wanted to engage this issue because of how hot things were with where they were. And she was concerned for what was going on for her son. And her son's reply to her, it absolutely just pierced my heart. He said, this African-American young boy, he goes, don't worry, mom, I'll hang out with my white friends. My children have never had to worry about their skin color or whether they were safe. Never. And here's this boy going, don't worry, I'll hang out with the white kids, I'll be fine. You haven't had that experience. I have another friend who, he was talking with me how he had to guide his, his daughters differently, coach them differently because they're African American. I have one of our church members here posted on social media. She said, I'm always worried when my husband's late or doesn't come home on time. I wonder if something happened. Guys, I don't think that way. I don't have those thoughts. Here's the deal. We need to listen to our African-American brothers and sisters. We even need to listen to other minorities and ask the question, what do you go through? What is your life like? Because here's the thing. It's not like our life. Those of us are white. I have a challenge for you. Maybe even some of my uh, minority friends here in the church are going to be upset with me about this, but maybe what you need to do is just simply sit down and ask questions and listen. Just ask questions and listen. And again, maybe if you, if you are a minority at Mercy, you might say, okay, I don't need any more people asking me questions. I'm tired of this. I, I get it. I, I get both sides. But the most powerful thing that I'm learning right now is to listen to other people's experiences. It's actually showing me that I am very ignorant even though I've lived all over the world, I, I'm still ignorant of other people's experiences. I um, read online an experience uh, that I, I want to share with you. The guy who wrote this is an African-American police officer. His name is Justin. In fact, I even um, Facebook messaged him and just said thank you for him sharing. Uh, but I want you to hear his story because I don't think it's like a lot of people's stories. I want you to hear his words. He said this, Justin, first and foremost, I'm a black man and I'm proud of it. I'm a cop too, and I'm proud of that as well. 
I make some people nervous when I'm off duty in street clothes. I make some people uneasy when I'm in uniform. I've been stereotyped by other races undeservingly. I've been accused of having a fake badge one time when I was in a heated confrontation and had to display it while off duty because apparently a black guy who looks like me can't possibly be a cop. I've been shot seven times on duty just for simply doing my job, but when I recovered, I was told by my then boss to get back out there and act like it never happened. Then the white guy who shoots me gets a bond, which leaves me thinking how different this would have been if it was a white police officer and the suspect was black. They say police lives matter, but apparently at the time, the judge who set the bond didn't think my life did. I've sometimes felt like I was too black for the badge and too blue for the brothers. I'm in a constant no-win situation every day of my life in and out of uniform. I'm mistreated as a black man. I'm hated as a cop. And at the end of the day, it doesn't stop me from being the best husband and father and son and most obedient and faithful child of God I can be. It also doesn't stop me from being the best, most competent police officer I can be as well, despite the dangers and risks that come with the job. I'm, a, I'm flawed as a man and as a cop, and I'm willing to love and help and protect and befriend anyone, no matter what your race is. Why? Because that's what God wants me to do. My morals and values have to remain positive at all times in or out of uniform. What happened to George Floyd was disgusting, unacceptable, and could have been de-escalated de in a safer manner. But what scares me is what happened to him could easily have happened to one of my family members or friends or even me. There is a large number of police officers of all races in this country that simply lack good people and communication skills. Those are the bad cops that make this job hard for the good cops like me. Despite everything I've been through, I continue to do this job humbly because someone has to do it the right way and it needs to be done. Not all black men are a threat. Not all cops are bad either. I have the right to speak from both sides. Don't let the mistakes of a few ruin the perception and reputation of the many. Love to everyone. I will never experience anything like that. I will never fully understand that. But man, how bold it was for him. Church, we need to listen and to learn from those who don't have experiences like us. I will say this to anyone of color at Mercer Creek Church. If you need to talk, I will make time for you. I want to hear your story. I'm learning so much right now. And if your story can help inform the greater Mercer story, I'll listen in fact, all of, all of us in leadership will listen. Please email me or call. And I, I also want to briefly address the other disenfranchised cultures um, that this question was about. One way we actually do address disenfranchised cultures is that we partner with those who are really better at doing some of the, um, the good work in our community that we're just not equipped to do. So we have a partnership with the Fish Food Bank. I mean, even though they moved off our property, we love them very, in fact, I just wrote a, a letter for Peggy just a couple weeks ago. We love fish. We think they're one of the greatest organizations here in town. We host the cold weather shelter in cold months. We want to make sure those who are homeless have a warm place to stay. Uh, that just matters to us. We want to be part of that solution. We um, have something called pastoral partners who help care for the needy in our community when they need like a gas card or man, they don't have a place to sleep or need food. We, we can help with resources and point them in the right directions. We love what Judy is doing over at CareNet for young mothers. Mercer wants to serve the disenfranchised and we hope you will support these efforts as well. And remember that when you love your neighbor really well, no matter what they look like or what color they are. God, this is God's first and best direction for us as a church to get the love out. Neighboring really matters and even more during times like this. On a personal note, um, and I want to end with this. I've lived a lot of places. You've heard me say that before. I've lived in eight different states, three different continents. I've had a blessed life. Uh, this year, both my sons are graduating from college. And again, this is my story, but I want you to hear what I told my son when he was going to cut my oldest son, when he was going to college um, four years ago. I sat him down. I said, Jackson, I want you to hear something. 
You are one of the most privileged kids on the planet. What do I mean by that? I said, Jackson, your grandma and grandpa King loved Jesus and were married all their life and still are. Both my parents are both still alive, love Jesus. That's a privilege, married to each other. Grandma and grandpa heard they both passed away, but they loved Jesus to the very end and they were married to each other whole life. Again, that's a privilege to have both sets of grandparents stay married and, and, and really model a healthy home. I mean, it's, it's such a gift. Your mom and dad, well, at least your mom, mom puts up with your dad, but at least we've been married for 20 some years at the time when, when we first, uh, when I said this to him. I said, we're together. Um, you haven't grown up with tons of chaos and, 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 and really ha you've had a healthy home life. I go, you're privileged because of that. Jackson, you're six foot four inches tall. You're handsome, you're smart. He was one of the kids who gave the speech at graduation. He was good in football, good in basketball. He, he was just a great athlete, great. I go, Jackson, everything about you says that you have all the right stuff. And here's the, on top of all that privilege, Jackson, you were able to check the box Native American because of your mother. You could check the box Hispanic because of your mother. And you look white. And in our culture, I knew above all things, and this is my son's experience, our family experience. I said, Jackson, you are so privileged. Make sure you use that for God's glory. I was thinking about that conversation I had with my son, and I wanna have a different conversation with you as a church. Church, we are, and I'm gonna give you a new term, and I, I'm stealing this from, uh, uh, I'm twisting something that's been in culture, but I'm gonna steal it. I want you to hear this. You are Christ privileged. You are Christ privileged, which means that you have grace and love and kindness and you are flowing in forgiveness and, and seeking justice and helping the oppressed. This is what God has called you to. You are Christ privileged, which means that humility is our methodology and compassion is our means, which means that you have a responsibility to be like Jesus, your savior. So love like Jesus and help our brothers and sister of every tribe know his love right here and right now, especially the African-American culture. Let me finish by giving you a picture of what Jesus is leading us to. In the last book of the Bible, we're given a glimpse of heaven. And here's what it looks like. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And here is John giving a prophetic vision of what will happen someday. And here's what we believe about God's word is God's word is true. And what it's giving us is truth. And this is a truth for our future. Think about this. Every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Church, the vision of the future, heaven that we long for someday is going to look white and black and brown and every other color in between. God longs for all people to come to himself. This is saying to us right here is we're going to be, there's not going to be a white heaven and a black heaven and a brown heaven. It's not going to work that way. God blends all of us together because he wants all of us to be together. And we need to practice now the thing that's going to last forever. Racism can have no part of what we are doing. We must do everything we can to be active, to engage our culture, to help our culture become something new and better and different. This is an ancient evil and it must be eradicated. We must do whatever we can to push against the kingdom of darkness and advance the kingdom of heaven so that God's rule and reign can happen in Kittitas County as it does on earth. Amen. Pray with me that we would humbly pursue that. Let me pray. God of the universe, you're so good and you care for everybody so much. Lord, I ask that we would own Peter's prayer, that each and every one of us would fear you and do what is right. Lord, do not let us be silent or lazy or non-caring or lack compassion. May we as a church body listen to the Spirit's prompting and care for all people. Lord, even though our minorities here in Kittitas are small, would we pray, would we 
be prayerful and long to be in relationship with our black community, with our um, uh, Hispanic community, with our um, Asian community, Lord, with our um, Pacific Island community, Lord, everyone, it doesn't matter who they are. May we look at them not, not, not with a false lens that says, oh, there is no color, but with this desire to say, oh no, God's beautiful gift of someone who's different than me is what I long to be a part of. I want to, I want to be in lives. I want to enrich people. I want to encourage people. I want to lift people up. There is no one better or worse than me. We're all simply one in the body of Christ. God, we need a new vision and we need to do what it takes to become active to make this happen. Lord, give us courage to not be passive, but to be active. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to finish our time today by going and having the Lord's Supper. So if you haven't got those little elements, I encourage you to grab those right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read and then I'm going to give you a time of silence. And at the end of the time of silence, feel free to take uh, the communion elements in your own time. But I want to put a framework around communion that maybe you haven't had or noticed in a while. It's the, the typical line we, we receive is, this is what Jesus said, is for what I received from the Lord. This is and Paul's saying this, I also pass on to you. He says this, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. I, I just want to stop for a second and, and look at that phrase, on the night he was betrayed. Jesus knew that he had all authority all power, all privilege, all rights, that he was the creator of everything. Even though he knew all that, he laid down all of what he was for everyone else. And as we take communion this time, I, I want to know what do we need to lay down so that we don't think of ourselves better than anyone else? What do we need to give to the Lord of the universe and simply say, Lord, I want my life to match your life. A life of humility that is the opposite of racism. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we are taking Holy Communion and remembering the God of the universe who gave up everything for everyone else, May we be convicted in our spirits about what we need to give up for others. Church, now is the time for action. It's the time to pursue and to love those who live around us. What is God telling you? Confess that, have the conversation with him, and then at your own timing, take those elements and celebrate that God is very, very good. Let's take a moment of silence.
God, it has been so good worshiping with you, worshiping with our brothers and sisters gathered across this county and beyond. God, it's humbling just to, to think that you're the one who calls us to, to you. You're the one who calls us to life. You've called us to so much. Thank you that you've called us into relationship with you. And God, as we prepare to go into this week, I pray that, that we would be aware of your presence, that you would be the one who guides us, you would be the one who leads us. You would remind us afresh every day of your love, of your calling on our lives. God, we wanna seek you, we wanna be with you this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And, and I just want you to know if, if you would like to join us in some of these live worship gatherings, make sure you follow the links on all of our social media, on the email you may have received, uh, contact our office. But we'd love to have you join us in these gatherings in the weeks ahead. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and we'll see you next week.